Christ-like compassionate virtue and forgiveness in the sacrament of reconciliation. During this time of mission, we have another opportunity to experience God's forgiveness and to bring forgiveness to one another. May God's forgiving love and healing words enlighten our minds and change our hearts. <clears throat> our souls for this evening are weak and great. They remind us of the great gift of the Eucharist. Please join in singing hymn number 459, Come to Me, number 459. Please join in singing O Solid Taurus Ostia on the inside back cover of the hymn book in Latin verses.
Please join in singing hymn number 672. reading from the Gospel according to Luke. The tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, at which the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, 
this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then he addressed this parable to them. Who among you, if he has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wasteland and follow the lost one until he finds it? And when he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders in jubilation. Once arrived home, he invites friends and neighbors in and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, there will likewise be more joy in heaven over one repentant sinner than over ninety-nine righteous people who have no need to repent. The Gospel of the Lord. Friends, it's really good to see you tonight. I'm going to talk about the wonderful gift of God's mercy and forgiveness. And before, if you don't mind, I can talk to Jesus now that he's been exposed here in this wonderful way. Loving Jesus, you promised to be with us all days till the end of time. You know you are with us in many different ways. You dwell within us. You come to us in the sacraments. The two or three are gathered in your name, there are you in the midst. But we thank you especially for this wonderful gift of your blessed sacrament, that you can get inside of us, that you can live in us, that you can nourish us. You just sang to him, come to me, all you who labor and are heavily burdened. We can come to you with all our burdens. Your yoke is easy, your yoke with us, you carry your bur our burdens with us and for us. Right from the beginning, Lord, some people didn't believe. They were your followers, many of them, and they, they saw you calm the storm. They, they saw you heal people. So you feed people. So you change water into wine, and they just couldn't go far enough to believe that you wanted to stay with us in this form. You found a way to extend your resurrected body for all of us to enter into us. We thank you for the faith that believes this, Lord, and we ask that it increase our faith. And I we use the symbols of wheat and grapes. As Sister Mary said, they, they are changed into bread and wine, and ultimately, if they're lucky, they are changed finally into your body and blood. You can change anything, Lord, so we want to be changed, we want to be transformed, we want to be molded. Enter into us, make us, make us more loving and more kind and more forgiving. Help us to be nourishing to other people rather than toxic. We don't burn with love, some people will die of the cold, so help us to burn with love, Lord. Help me tonight to celebrate a great gift of forgiveness. I heard this story of a, a young kid, he was kind of tough, and he went to confession. He said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. He said, put me down for two angels, one mortal, and a couple of originals. <laughs> he also heard the story of a 16-year-old girl who said, you mean I have to tell my sins to a man? We understand that, don't we? But she didn't understand the depth of the importance of God's healing by being able to tell. He was being able to get it out. The 32nd Psalm says, I, I kept it in and invested within me. I got it out and I was healed. I knew that. There's something about getting it out. Do you know the, uh, fifth, the fifth step in the 12 step programs? You know, the first three steps is I can, you can, and I invite you to. Basically, that's it. It's helplessness and faith in God, and I'm asking God, and will, willing God to come into it. The fourth step is make a fearless inventory of your life. You know, if you think that with alcohol or drugs, many, many things are part of that. Lying and, and stealing and many other things, and you have to make a fearless inventory. But then the 
fifth step is you got to tell somebody else. I've been privileged to hear many a fifth step as a general confession. We have a lot of retreats on for people who are addicted. You know? And it's very important to get it out. Get it out. We acknowledge it. Acknowledge it. That, that step is just we acknowledge we have sinned and we turn to God. And we ask God's forgiveness. That should be the step. You know? and, and then, you know, we have to tell it to somebody else. People who didn't go to a priest for their fifth step, they told their sponsor or somebody else that they had to, had to get it on you know? uh, so, you know, the social nature of sin is this thing. It affects other people. Our goodness brings graces down onto the body of Christ. And when we sin, we draw energy out of the body of Christ. And if we sin seriously, since we've sinned against the body of Christ, we've sinned against God and the body. Uh, the way back into the body of Christ is through the sacrament of reconciliation. But the smaller sin is many ways God begins. God forgives every day we go to Mass and at the beginning we say we're sorry. You know? Many other ways. The sacrament of, of anointing, even if you're unconscious, you're sorry for your sins, they are taken away. God has many ways of doing my, my thing tonight is to try to wrap up, it's not about us. Sometimes we get so concerned about our sins we forget. It should be more about God and his mercy, God and his forgiveness. My job tonight is to try to remind you of God's forgiveness and God's mercy. And to, to be in awe of it, really. I'm going to tell you three stories, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament and one of more modern stories. We just sang the song Hosea, right? You know why it's called Hosea? Come back to me with all your heart. Don't let fear keep us apart. Long have I waited for you coming home to me, living our new life. No? Well, Hosea was a prophet. Prophet, the word means to speak for the place of people. I'm, I'm using the gift of prophecy. We all got it at baptism. Every time you taught your children truth and goodness, every time you corrected anybody, any time you forgave anybody, any time you encouraged anybody, you're using the gift of prophecy. So God went to Hosea and he said, I want you to be my prophet. And so Hosea said, all right, Lord. And he said to him, I want you to speak more by your actions than your words. So they speak louder. And Hosea, not knowing what was coming, said, all right, Lord. And God said to him, said to him I, I want you to marry Gomer. Gomer was a woman. He said, Lord, you know what business she's in? The oldest business in the world? He said, I can't marry her. My friends are laughing at me. He said, I don't care about your friends. I want to show my children that I love them, and even if those they've prostituted themselves, I will enter into the deepest of relationship. The deepest you know is marriage. It's even deeper than marriage because I come and live in them. You know? So Hosea married Gomer, and they had some children. And after a while, she was unfaithful to him. He threw her out. And God said, take her back. He said, Lord, she's been unfaithful. My friends have laughed at me. He said, I don't care about your friends. You're going to show who I am. My children, I love them. If they're, if they're sorry, I'll always take them back over and over and over again. It's pretty positive, isn't it? You know, that's the message of, of Jesus in the, in the New Testament. If we're supposed to forgive 70 times 7, the compassion does your heavenly Father is compassionate. The New Testament story is from Luke 15. We all know it as the prodigal son. Some have suggested that maybe prodigal meaning wasteful, that maybe it would have been better to call it the prodigal father, since he would seem to be more wasteful in a way. I like to think of this story in the light of Bonanza. Remember? Paul, one, one green played Paul. And Dan Blocker played for us. We only need two here, so we're going to put him aside. But remember, Michael Landon played Little Joe. So just imagine Little Joe going to his father and say, Pa, how about giving me my share of the inheritance while I'm still young enough to go out and sow some wild oats? Now, obviously, the story is about God and not about the ordinary father. I, I think that I would say something like this. I say, wait a minute now. This inheritance stuff is not an automatic. Stay around and be faithful, and, and I'll probably give you something, you know? But God has given us our gifts, and he's given us 
us free will. He doesn't want us to use them, but you know, he will forgive us and he hopes that we learn from it. You know? So little Joe goes out and if he were living today, he would probably be the type that would be setting up the drinks in the bar room and buying friends. His brother accused him of spending his money on women, you know, maybe diamonds or fur or coats or whatever was the going rate then, you know. And he had a lot of friends because of his generosity or wasting. But remember the story goes that just when he ran out of money, there was a terrible famine. And he really, to stay alive, he had to feed pigs. The only job he could get, and that's against the Jewish religion. You don't eat pigs and curse to those who feed them. And so he hit bottom and he realized, he said, he acknowledged, it's the big thing we have to acknowledge, he acknowledged, I have sinned. I have sinned against God and against my father. And back in my father's ranch, the uh, hired hands ate me three square meals a day, and here I am looking at the father that they feed these pigs and thinking it's good enough to eat. When I was a kid, I lived by a farm owned by the Sisters of St. Joseph, and I remember they fed the pigs. It was a lot of times with barrels of swill. Gorgeous. They can be hungry enough to think, now how do you have to be that you'd, that you'd like to eat? So he goes back, and the line I like the best is, it says, the father saw him from a great distance. You think that the father just happened to be walking out, maybe it's getting towards the dusk, and he had a nice meal, and he's out smoking a cigar, and he sees somebody coming up the road, and he says, well, I'll be gosh darn, it's my son, little Joe, coming back. No, the father's always watching, and not from a distance. He's right there, he's inside of us. Remember that ad with the uh, Jolly Green Giant ad? A little fellow one time, he's, he's in the, the, the cornfield and he's leaning up against that, what he thinks is a tree. And he yells, giant, where are you? And he hears this voice above and he realizes he's leaning up against the giant's leg, you know? God is always totally present to, to us, you know? And so when he was watching and watching and finally he sees him and his heart's filled. And his heart's filled. Uh, I think if I were the, the, the uh, it, the son starts saying, God, Father, you know, I've sinned against you and against God. I'm not worthy to be your son. And the Father said, don't even have to say any more, you know. Probably I would have said something like, don't step on this land. And what, hell, you put your mother and me through all these years? Could they send us a postcard let us know you're still alive? You know, I think that would be ordinary father if it be anger. But this represents God. This is revelation of God. God doesn't hold grudges against us. God just, he was so full of joy. What did he do? He ran out to him. That's totally against the culture. The culture, you wait and, you know, you wait for him. He ran out to him. Close his arms around him. What did he say? He said, you know, get, get, uh, kill the fatty calf. I don't know if that's veal or steaks, but it's going to be a good deal, you know. And, and he said, you know, probably said, <coughs> Get, get a shower ready, he's been feeding pigs. You know, and get some nice clothes, but bring me a ring. What's the thing about? You can say all you want. I hate you to say I don't even believe in God. No matter what, we're still God's children. We can't give it away. He's sustaining us, loving us into existence. He put the ring on, said, you're always my son, no matter what you say. You know, that, that's what it's about. We can't give it away. We're so dependent on God, we just can't give it away. Even if we say it, we, we can still live. Remember the older son? He he was he didn't have the big heart of his father, did he? You know? I've seen people like that, you know, they're very rigid and you know, and, and they're doing the best they can. You know, and the father loved him too. So what did the father do? Did he yell at his son? No. No, no recriminations to the prodigal son coming back. No recriminations to his other son who's being small. He goes out to him and says, you know. Everything I have is yours, but your, your brother was dead. He's alive now. We have to celebrate. There's more rejoicing of, in heaven when any one of us acknowledges our sinfulness and comes to God. And 99 who don't think they need it. That's because God is the most, God is most hard in one respect when he's allowed to, we, we open up the door. He will not impose on us when we invite him in to show his mercy and his forgiveness. Always the same. Never, you never went too far. As long as 
story of this each taken its time. The modern story is this. There's a, a young man in 1951 who lived in Brooklyn, and he was going to Fordham University. And the Korean War started, and he uh, decided to leave the college and to join the Marines, but by first complete. He was trained in mine detection. And he met a young man from, uh, his name was Richie Manning, okay? And his, he met a young man from Chicago named Ray Brennan. And they became real close friends. And they were sent to Korea together. And their job was to go up at, when the flight came to search for mines, so if the scouts went up in those days, or they weren't as high tech then, or if they were going to move up, they would search. He said, we were in the front and the foxhole was still pitch black, and we were trying to relax when we were talking. And he said, my friend Ray forgot himself. He lit up a cigarette. And out of the night came a grenade and it landed between them. And he fell on it, put the cigarette down almost nonchalantly, he fell on it, it exploded in his stomach. He kind of winked at me and he died. So when Richie Manning left the Marines, he decided to join the Franciscans and become a priest. And in those days, more of those than we do today, they, they could take a new name as a new life. So he took the name when he took his vows as a friend who died for him, Brennan. But he'd be known as Brennan Manning. And I'm just telling you a story I've heard him tell on a tape, okay? It moved me so much that I'm telling, passing it on to you. He said, something, early on in his priesthood, something went wrong in his relationship with the family. <coughs> I think I know what happened because it's kind of happened to me too. I think he got too close to the wife and he started to fall in love with her a little bit. And he realized, you know, this wasn't right, so he backed out. Well, she got very angry at him. She said, you know what, you're a phony. You don't know how to love at all. You're just a phony. No one had ever said anything like that to him before. And he said, is she right? Am I doing this because I love God or am I doing it because I'm good at it and I get attention? He went into a depression. And around that time, he was giving a mission in a small town outside of New Orleans. He said, yeah, that week, he said, you can feel the presence of God. You know, there's just something about it. He just sensed it. So at the end, he asked people if they wanted to witness to anything. He said, some of them, a couple of people got up and said they, they just, they knew God loved them before, but now it was a little different. They were sure, and they know they were forgiven. There was a joy to it. But many missions, that, that's the great gift that people get. A couple of people said they had asked for physical healing and they had been healed. There were some young people that felt they were called to follow a vocation as a priest or a brother or a sister. So when he got on his plane, <clears throat> he, was, he was stationed at, uh, outside of Philadelphia. And he got on the plane and the plane flew up to Chicago. I'm not sure if they do that now, but it did not have flew to Chicago and then you switched to go east to west. And he was on the plane and he was feeling great. He said, boy, this is great. You feel joy when you see the good working of God. He was feeling great and he said to himself, though, he said, when did you pray during this week? All right, you prayed the mass with the people, but you didn't say you grieved the hurry, you prayed with Christians. You didn't say you rose me. You didn't pray. You are a phony. And he went through a deeper depression. And when the plane stopped at Chicago, Instead of going on, he went to see Mrs. Brennan, whom he had taken on as a second mother, even though his, his mother, own mother was still alive in Brooklyn. He said he sat in the afternoon with her about some of the soaps. At supper time, he wanted to help her feed her very challenged son, 42 years old, deaf, blind, and still in the diaper. But he wouldn't feel sorry for her. She felt the privilege to take care of his son. That night, they were sitting together, and, and he was really low. And he said, Mom, did Ray love me? And she said, oh, come on now, Richie, don't be saying things like that. He said, Mom, did he love me? She got angry. I don't want to hear any more of this. He said a third time, I gotta go, did he really love me? And this little Irish woman, five feet tall, never cursed in her life, and she stood up and she said, Jesus Christ, man, what more could he have done for you? What more could he have done for you? He sat there sobbing. What more could he have done for you? 
And she took his hand and she started to rub it and she said, it's all right, but she, I guess sometimes we need to be reassured. And I asked Jesus, how much do you love me? He stretched out his arms and he said, this much. And he died for me. And the story of a ship that went on the rocks of Maine. <clears throat> the townspeople formed a human chain to take the people and the sailors off before the ship went down. The last man off the ship, he turned around, and the last man on the human chain, his hand was so tired and sweaty that he slipped, and he fell in between the ship and the rocks, and he was crushed to death. That man couldn't stop saying the rest of his life, you know, a man died for me once. A man died for me once. Jesus said, greater love than this no one has, and he laid down his life for his friends. And I call you my friend because I invited you into the family. You know my father, you know my spirit. What more could he have done for us? So tonight we celebrate that. Uh, if you'd like to stay and visit with Jesus in the Eucharist, fine. If you'd like to receive the sacrament, and maybe many of you probably have recently received the sacrament, and you know, you don't have to go again, of course. Uh, but maybe some of you haven't, and you'd like to. There's three of us here in confessions tonight. We'll have a little preparation for that from the from the, from the, from the people. But, but some people say if they haven't been to confession for a while, well, I don't know how to do it. And they say, well, I tell you, as soon as I still go the way I went as a little kid, I go, for me it's easy, I just go upstairs and knock on one of the priests below and say, did you hear my confession? He's usually go to the same one, you know. And I tell them how long. I get it's the same one, I don't even have to tell them how long. The, the, the length of time it helps the priest to relate to you. He's, you say 40 years, you know, he, he's going to be, be super sensitive because he knows it takes a lot of courage and faith to come in after 40 years, okay? But if you're just one that's been there and one before, you know, you're on a regular trail, you know, it helps, it helps the peace. That's why you, why you do that, you know? And, and you don't have to tell all your venial sins or lesser sins. Uh, church suggests that you pick one or the other that might be ingrained in you. That you really want God to work on the ingrained part. You know, maybe you always, out of a lack of security, you talk about people a lot, or criticize them, something may give you that, you know. Uh, whatever it might be, you know. You, you, don't, you don't have to be sorry for them all, just say one or the other, you don't have to say. The big sins, you know, they've offended the, the body of Christ. Uh, you have to give the number if you can. You can't say I murdered somebody when I was 25, you know. So, so, but it really is not supposed to be an oppressive thing. It's supposed to be your honesty with God, so God gives you peace. So it's your acknowledging and bringing, bringing it out, and that there's healing in that. You know, Carl Jung, the great psychiatrist, uh, he said when Catholics used to go to confession more regularly, we didn't see so many of them in our psychiatric offices. So in the past, not a lot of people worked through a lot of things that they, I mean, therapy can be helpful. You know, but sometimes it was just enough for, the, for this sacrament. Uh, sister will tell you that, that when we're finished, uh, you know, you can leave any time. You can say, this is from Jesus if you'd like, and so forth. We will do a, a, a little service, and in the service we're going to say the act of contrition. So you won't have to say the act of contrition in the confession. Please will give you, absolute, give you the, a penance and absolution. At which point I always ask Sister Mary if I forgot any. For all these years, I don't know why. No, I just have to mention.
Thank you. 